ladies and gentlemen, we'll make a start. And um, for those of you who are from outside the LSE, welcome to the school uh, for the latest in a continuing series of lectures by the, uh, hosted by the Department of Management here, which we set up uh, three or four years ago to bring together all our management teaching and to uh, expand our management offering here at the school. And we're delighted that this year we are welcoming um, Costas Macridis, who is the Bob Bauman Chair in Strategic Leadership at the London Business School, but who is in fact here in the department this term on sabbatical. Uh, so uh, he is a uh, home team at the moment, uh, even though um, normally in some institution we don't normally like to mention um, up uh, somewhere in North London. I don't even know where it is exactly. But um, uh, he's going to talk to us um, about a rather relevant topic, how to avoid uh, financial crises uh, in the future. Um, and um, if he has a comprehensive answer to this, there is a ready market uh, for his answer. It's certainly in Dublin. Um, and uh, probably in Lisbon and points other capital cities in the south of Europe thereafter. Uh, Costas is um, from Cyprus, which so far hasn't had a sovereign debt crisis, but you never know. Um, uh, and um, without further ado, let me welcome you Thank to the school and over to you. Thank you very much. Next time is on. Okay, good evening to all. Thank you very much for being here. I was, uh, when I was asked to give this speech, I, I was trying to think. What kind of speech should I give to attract an audience? And I came up with this title. What do you think? Sexy enough? <laughs> I think I chose well. Um, let me, I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes and uh, then we'll open it for, for questions. Is that okay? But if there are any burning questions as I go along, by all means raise your hand and I'll try and answer it. Let me start off. Howard, you may want to. Okay. Move away from there, otherwise you won't you be able to see this slide. It's okay. I'm just saying. Okay, so let me start off with a couple of examples just to get in the mood. I don't know if you've ever heard of this uh, particular incident, the murder of a lady called Kitty Genovese in New York, 1964. How many of you have heard of it? Okay, a few people. This is a true story. This lady was a waitress in a bar, 1964, in the evening, 2 o'clock in the morning when the, the, the bar closed. She drove down to downtown Manhattan parked her car and started walking towards uh, her house, her apartment block. Suddenly she was attacked by a guy with a knife who hit her. She fell down, started screaming, help, help, help. It was two in the morning. People were obviously asleep, but enough people heard the noise. They woke up, you could see lights coming on in the apartment block. Enough people saw what was happening to start shouting at the guy. Go away, leave the girl alone. The guy takes the knife, runs away. The girl is injured, but manages to slowly stand up and walk towards her apartment to call an ambulance, to call the police. Five minutes later, while she's still trying to get into the building, the guy comes back a second time, attacks her again. Again, she starts shouting, help, help, help. Again, people from their windows look at the incident and start shouting at the guy, go away, leave the girl alone. The guy runs away a second time. The girl is now seriously injured. She manages to crawl towards the front stairs of her building when this guy comes back and kills her. The police, they come, they do their investigation, and listen to this. According to a story in the New York Times, 39 rational human beings, like me and you, witnessed this murder, and nobody called the police, let alone go downstairs to help. I suppose you can understand why people are unwilling to go downstairs to help. It's dangerous, he's got a knife, it's the middle of the night, I don't want to be involved. That I understand, but not calling the police? It's amazing, isn't it? Now please think about that incident. If it was you watching this, would you have done something? Hello? Of oh, course, yes. You are LSC people, of course you would. Yeah. It's just these 39 New Yorkers. It's New York after all, isn't it? You would expect that in New York. Yeah. Can I ask you another question? Do you think that these 39 people, did they know what they had to do? 
Did they, did they, what, what is it? Maybe they're sitting there saying, oh, I wonder now, what should I do? What should I do? Should I call the police? Did they know what they had to do? Yes. Yeah, it's not a matter of them not knowing. So something else drove their behavior, I suppose, not knowledge. Something else drove their behavior, okay? Keep that in mind. Another story, you can Google this one actually, and you're gonna see the video. This happened in Harford, Connecticut in May 2008. If you, if you Google, just go into Google and say, hit and run victim, Hartford. You're gonna get a beautiful 30 second CCTV video of this incident. A 77 year old man, he had gone into the grocery to buy some milk. He comes out and he's crossing the street. As he's crossing the street, a car, a car comes by, hits him. You see the guy flying in the air, and then what? The guy who hits him, what does he do? Drives away, yeah. And then for the next 30 seconds, what you see is other cars coming by. The guy is lying in the middle of the road. What do the other cars do? Do they stop to take care of the guy? No, what do they do? They avoid, drive around him and go. The worst are the pedestrians. You see the pedestrians, you know, walking down on the pavement, they see the incident, you see them pointing. They're pointing to the car just got hit. And after they point at him, what do they do? They walk away. Again, nobody called the police. It so happened that about 15 minutes later, a police car passed by for another incident and stopped to see what goes wrong. Can you imagine? This is not New York, huh? this is half of Connecticut, it's a different city. Still in America though. <laughs> Again, can I ask you, if he goes you, would you have stopped? Of course, yes. We're not like them, are we? And second question, did these guys, did they know what the right thing to do was? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a matter of education again. Okay, last example and then I'll make my point. I don't know if you know this uh, series of experiments done in 1972 with Catholic priests. How many of you know those? Just a couple, okay. Let me tell you, this, this is a psychologist from Stanford University actually decided to, you know, explore what uh, determines how people behave. This is what he did. He went to a school in New Jersey where they were training people to become priests, Catholic priests. And then he stood at the entrance to the school. Whenever a priest will come by, he will stop him and ask him, excuse me, Father, could I ask for a big favor? And when the priest will say, yes, what is it? He'll say, well, today we invited here to our school some children from the local elementary school so that one of us can give them a speech about Jesus and the life of Jesus. Unfortunately, the priest who was supposed to talk to the kids, he's sick. He's got the flu and cannot go and talk to the kids. So I'm asking you, can you go and talk to the kids? It's not going to take 10, 10, 15 minutes of your time. Can you do it? That's the request. What do you think the priest said? This is 1972, okay? Do not impose your knowledge of the priests uh, of today on that, you know. What do you, think, what do you think the priest said in 1972? Yeah, most of them say, yeah, okay, I've got 10 minutes, I'll go and talk to the kids. Now, here's the experiment. To half of them, he'll say, thank you very much for agreeing to do it. The children arrived here half an hour ago. And for the last half hour, they've been sitting in that room over there. Could you please go right away? It's embarrassing, they've been sitting there waiting. To the other half of the priest, he'll say, thank you very much for agreeing to do it. The children have not arrived here yet. But you know what? We expect them any minute, and when they do arrive, they're gonna wait in that room. Could you please go and wait for them? Now you see the two scenarios. Yes, half of the priests were put on there. Pressure, what kind of pressure? Time pressure, and half of the priests were told you have time. And then the only thing he did to complete the experiment is that in the corridor leading up to this room where the kids were supposed to be, he put an old man lying down on the floor having a heart attack. The experiment was to see whether these priests will stop to help the old man or to even ask what's wrong. So please, imagine, you are the priest. You're walking towards uh, the room in this corridor and right there in front of you is an old man shouting, help, help, call a doctor. Would you have stopped? Yes. Again, all of you will stop? Yes. My God, you all pass your course. You can leave us see now. All of you. Would you expect the priest to stop? Yes. Of course you'd expect. Do you think they stopped? It wouldn't be a good experiment if they all stopped now, would it? 
So what he found is the following, the 50% of the priests who were told you have time, all of them stopped to see what's wrong. The other 50% were put under time pressure, listen to this, three out of 10 will not stop. Three out of 10. And these are priests, yeah? They are supposed to stop, aren't they? In fact, we pay them to stop. It's in their <laughs> key performance indicators to stop, isn't it? You know, it was you or me, the scum of the universe, I can understand why you don't stop, but the priest? So at first, this psychologist, he thought, maybe they did not see the old man. Maybe they were in such a hurry, they just walked past him. So you know what he did? He repeated the experiment, and this time he put the old man perpendicular in the corridor. <laughs> Guess what? Three out of 10 of the priests would go there, jump off the guy and go. <laughs> would you have stopped? Yeah. Of course you would, yes because you're not representative of the population out there, are you? Did these priests know what they had to do? Did they know? Yes. Of course they did. They didn't have to go back to school to learn. Whenever there is somebody in need, you stop to help. We all know what to do, they still did not do it. So, point number one, therefore. Would you agree with me that I've just described three examples of what I would call suboptimal behaviors? Behaviors that, you know, are not good. We like to improve them. Would you agree with that statement? Ideally, you know, you'll want your fellow citizens, if you're lying on the street shouting, help, 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 for them to stop, to see what goes wrong with you. So you see suboptimal behaviors. Second point is that you've all told me, when I asked you, that these suboptimal behaviors arose not because the individuals concerned did not know what was the optimal behavior. It wasn't a lack of knowledge that drove the suboptimal behavior, was it? It was something else. Would you agree with that? This is just the basis of my argument now, huh? We need to agree on that. So this is not rocket science so far. This is very simple. You agree with these statements. Okay. So suppose now you're a policymaker. Suppose you're the government and you sit there and you see this kind of behaviors. You say, I don't like this kind of behaviors in my society. I like to improve them. I would like people in my country to stop and help people in need. What can I do to improve the number of people who stop to help. How can I improve these behaviors, in other words? So let me offer some policy options for you, and you tell me which one you like. Yes? One, of course, is, the question is, what can we do to ensure that we do not get sub suboptimal behaviors in the future, to get better behaviors? One option is, educate the people. Tell them, guys, this is the right thing to do. When you see somebody in need, stop and help. Educate people. What is the right thing to do? What do you think about that? Is it going to work? I'm an academic, and whenever anybody says, spend more money on education, I like it. I like it. <laughs> However, think about it. I mean, please reflect a little bit on it. Educate them about what? Educate them that, hey, guys, in time, when people are in need, you have to stop. The question I asked you was the following. Didn't they know already? Were these people that, you know, face this issue, then they the priests, they didn't know that they were supposed to stop, and now you're gonna educate them and oh, in the future, all of a sudden, they will stop. If the problem arose not because of lack of education, why should we spend more money on education? So, even though I like this idea, educate, 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 it's, it, I don't know if it's gonna work. Another idea, regulate, how about that? So if you catch anybody who doesn't stop to help, he or she is fine. 500 quid, and I don't care if you're a student, you don't get a discount. <laughs> what do you think about that? It doesn't have to be monetary, uh, monetary punishment. You know, I put your name, I collect all the names of people who did not stop to help, and I put them in the newspapers. And I say, oh, these are all sexual offenders. Not sexual, but you know what I mean. <laughs> what do you think about that? Is that going to work? Think about it. Because it doesn't have to be 500 quid. It could be 5,000 pounds if you don't stop. Or even 10,000 pounds. Ooh, all of a sudden you're sitting, oh man, maybe I should stop. I don't want to be fine. But of course you see that it may work. It will encourage people to do it. But you can see also people abusing the system. In other words, you could see possibilities of people looking around to see if anybody's watching. And if anybody's watching, they run away, so you can't catch them to find them. You could see that behavior, no? 
may be happening if they don't really want to get but that's one i mean they they have a policy like that in quebec city you know in quebec uh, province in quebec there is a law that says that you're required by law to stop and help people in need unless you put your own life in danger go figure now <laughs> you know anyway but it's a law and so on is it gonna work i don't know let's think about it another policy option is you reward you don't punish those who don't do it but you reward those who do it so you you stop to help you know glory and money to you 500 a thousand two thousand pounds what do you think about that good idea very good idea kind of reminds me i don't know if you read this story it was in the new york times a month ago they, they got these uh, judges federal judges in the united states they arrested them because um, they, they, these judges were um, you know, punishing lots of people by sending them to jail, a very particular jail, a private jail around in the state of uh, New York. And when they examined why, they found out that the private prison had put incentives in place saying to the judges that the more prisoners you send us, the more money we give you. So these guys thought, oh, that's a nice way to make money. <laughs> Caught uh, not coming late to class, go to prison for six months. <laughs> That kind of thing. So again, you could see incentives in there, distorting behaviors and doing stupid things and so on. So there you have it. These are three policy options. Education is one, regulation is another, special incentives is another. Are you happy? You think that will improve behaviors? That will get people to stop in times of need? What do you think? Well, the answer is yes. It would. <coughs> it would. If I, you know, if I give you money to do something, you will. Now, I cannot predict everybody's behavior. I cannot tell for sure that if I put a monetary reward, you will stop. But as an economist, I can tell you that on average, more people will stop and help if you put incentives down than if you don't. More people will stop and help on average if you punish the lack of stopping than if you don't. Not everybody. And I cannot tell you specifically you are going to stop or not, but on average, more people will and so on. So are you happy then? Should we put these policy policies in place? Is that the way to solve this problem we will face of people not stopping to help other people? What do you think? No. You know, why not? Because they work. Yeah. I put it in red, red, red. It says it works. <laughs> why not? It's artificial. What do you mean artificial? It doesn't get to the root of the problem. It doesn't get to the root of the problem. What is the root of the problem? <laughs> doesn't get hurt. So I hope you all agree with this gentleman's perspective in that, yes, I know it's going to work. These policies will work on average and so on. But somehow, they are deeply dissatisfying or unsatisfactory for us. Yeah? You're sitting there saying, you know, I don't think that regulation is the proper answer to getting people to stop and help other human beings. I don't think paying people, giving them money is the right way to get human beings in a society to stop and help other human beings in times of need. Even though it is a solution and it will get the results I want or higher results and so on, there's something, I think, about this kind of policy options I described that is dissatisfying, unsatisfactory. I don't even know if that word is correct. Unsatisfactory, yeah? Do you agree with that? Yeah, there's something, you know, you're sitting there saying, God, it doesn't sound like the right thing. And the question, of course, is why? Why is that? The gentleman there said it's artificial, it's whatever. Well, you can argue against these policy options in two ways. One is on the moralistic ground, on the moral ground, which is that the, it's not the right thing to do. People ought to stop and help other human beings, not because of the money, but because that's morality, that's the right thing. You can argue against those policy options on moral grounds, and I don't want to argue on moral grounds. I'm not a priest. I want to make my argument on not in moral grounds, but non-moral grounds. And what is the argument I'd like to propose to you is that all these solutions that I propose try to address the problem without going down to the root of the problem, saying, well, wait a minute, why is it that we've got these behaviors, these suboptimal behaviors to begin with? Before we actually give the medicine to people, shouldn't we know what the underlying source of the problem is? Just an analogy, suppose you go to your doctor and you say, well, doctor, I, I feel dizzy, you know, what should I do? And the doctor says, just lie down for 10 minutes and you'll be okay. 
I guarantee you lying down for 10 minutes, you will be feeling much better after 10 minutes. But suppose the problem is that you've got arteries that are clogged. And you just lie down for 10 minutes and now you feel better and then two, two, two days later you have a heart attack and you die. The medicine that the doctor prescribed to you, lie down for a couple of hours or a couple of minutes, whatever, was good in the short term but it didn't solve the problem. Could it be that the same thing is uh, happening here? We are prescribing medicine to solve a problem, suboptimal behaviors, that may improve the behaviors in the short term but will not solve them in the long term because it doesn't address the underlying sources of these suboptimal behaviors. The question we should be asking is, if we're really going to improve these behaviors, is we need to step back and say, okay, well, what are the underlying factors that led to these suboptimal behaviors? Because it's only by identifying and rectifying these underlying factors that we will solve the problem. If you get people misbehaving, before you even solve that problem, you have to ask yourself, well, what led to that misbehavior? If you see people in the city of London or Wall Street doing stupid things, selling you derivatives they shouldn't be selling you, leveraging you to the hill, or doing things that you don't think is optimal, before you can rectify that problem, you have to step back and say, well, wait a minute, what led to that behavior to begin with? It's only by identifying the underlying factors that led to the behavior that we can hope to develop a medicine that solves the underlying factors. What are these underlying factors? I mean, the generic question I'm asking you then is, okay, what determines how people behave? What determines human behavior? Well, we know what determines human behavior. You know, I'm not a social psychologist, but uh, over the last six months I've been reading a lot of uh, literature on social psychology, and this is what I've learned. What social psychology will tell you is that 70% of our behavior is determined not by our personality, not by how educated we are or whatever, but by the social context in which you place people. Let me explain what I mean by that. You remember all those questions I asked you, like, uh, would you stop to help a dying man? Would you stop and help somebody who's calling for help? And you all said, yeah, I'll stop. Well, my answer is, no, you won't. It depends on the situation I put you in. Even if you are the most moral, most educated person, there are many, many instances when you are not going to stop to help a dying man, depending on the underlying situation I put you in. Let me give you a couple of examples. Would you kill someone? How many of you will kill someone? Okay? Can I have your names? I'll pass them on to the police, please. <laughs> Always good to have diagnostic tools like that. And, uh, most of you will not kill a human being, eh? How about if I ask you? Politely. <laughs> if I pay you 100 pounds? 100 pounds will do the trick? 1,000? 10,000? We're talking pounds here. We're talking pounds, not this Mickey Mouse Euro stuff. Pounds. Okay. How many of you will actually kill a human being because I tell you, I'm the professor and I tell you, hey, come on, kill this guy. Some of you finally raise your hand, one or two, but I bet in real situation you wouldn't, huh? You wouldn't. Well, let me tell you of this experiment that was tried out in the 1960s. What's the experiment? You are supposed to ask another person a series of questions. Every time the other person answers incorrectly, you punish them. How do you punish them? By passing some electricity through their body. So you're sitting in front of this thing, you ask a question, if the person answers incorrectly, you press the button, boom, 20 volts of electricity go through his or her body. You ask another question, he or she answers incorrectly, you press another button, 40 volts of electricity. A third question, 100 volts. Fourth question incorrectly, 150 volts. And it goes on like this, 240 volts. And just to be sure that you know what you're doing, on the box with electricity, I will label some of the buttons and say, okay, now you are in dangerous territory. This button is lethal. This button is XXX lethal. <laughs> and the question, of course, is how far down the line would you go pressing the button, punishing the other person, killing them in effect, simply because there's a professor at the back of the room who says to you, go ahead, that's part of the experiment. Yes, you can do it. Would you do a thing like that? 
Some of you would. Well, let me show you a little bit. The, I'm sorry, the, the sound of this video is not very, it's not loud enough, but you'll get the picture. Let me show you a little bit. question is, has he signed his form legally? He said yes. Okay, I'll press the button. Three hundred and ninety volts. <laughs> you think that's lethal? <laughs> that is lethal, right? Now the question is the following: This experiment was done in the nineteen sixties. You know, lots of uh, subjects uh, involved. What percent of people would you expect to go all the way to lethal level? These are you saw the people here. You know, there some of them are students. They are rational human beings like you. These are not criminals. These are not supporters of Manchester City in any way, are they? <laughs> but uh, I'll play a job on your uh, team here. I know he's a Manchester City supporter. These are rational human beings, no? What percent of them would you expect to go all the way to press the lethal button? Forty percent, really? You would expect forty percent in this room to go ahead and okay? Twenty percent? Look, if if somebody asks me, yeah. 60%? Come on, you've been brainwashed here at LSC. 76%. If, if, look, if, I, <laughs> if I'm at a dinner party and somebody asks me what percent of the population out there do you expect to kill somebody just because the professor tells them kill them, I probably say, well, maybe one or two weirdos, but the rest of the people, nobody will do it. Yeah, I would, you know what percent they found? This is what shocked the psychiatrist who did this research. You know what percentage they found? 89% of people, 89% of people will actually press the lethal button. I mean, they, 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 they use these experiments to explain the, you know, how is it that the whole German nation followed Hitler's orders and, you know, executed, destroyed, I mean, killed millions and millions of the Jewish people and so on. Trying to explain how we obey authority simply because somebody in authority will say, yeah, yeah, go ahead, press the button. And the only concern this lady had, you saw in the video, was, has he signed his form, this guy? In case he dies, it's not me who is responsible now, is it? She's only concerned about the legal implications of her action, not whether she's going to kill the person or not. 89% of people, rational human beings, who, if you sit them in this room and ask them, would you kill somebody? They say, no, not me, not me, maybe them, but not me. And yet you put them in a situation like that, it's the situation that drove that behavior. Let me give you another example. Suppose 
You're walking down the street and you see three people beating up a young woman, a teenager. Would you stop to help? The question is the following. Suppose you are on your own versus suppose you are with your five of your buddies. When are you more likely to stop and help? When you are on your own or when with your friends, five of you? When would you expect? Of course you would expect with your friends. And yet you know what you know? Experiment after experiment will show that people are more likely to intervene when they are on their own than when they are with their friends. You know why? Because when you're with your friends, the institution of responsibility is like, well, maybe he'll do it, maybe he'll do it, maybe he'll do it. It's like I'm wearing my nice suit, I don't want to be involved, and so on. Whereas when you are on your own, you sit there and say, shit, it's either me or nobody here, isn't it? It's nowhere, nowhere to hide, yeah? Let me show you one of these experiments. Uh, it's a silent experiment, this one. What is the experiment? The first version of the experiment, you see the woman in a room, She's supposed to be filling out a form, and then smoke comes under the door. Imagine the following, you're in a room, and all of a sudden there's smoke coming out of the room, out of the door. What would you do? Well, go and look and call somebody, yeah? So this experiment repeated, when the woman is alone, and when the woman is in the room with five other people filling out the form, and the other five people are told, don't move, just sit there, even when the smoke comes in. Let's see what this woman does. Have a look at that. So the participant is alone. First experiment. There's no voice here, huh? She spotted the smoke. Can you see the smoke? And it is, what does she do? She picks her stuff up, and then she goes to call for help. Very rational behavior, isn't it? Yeah, so version two now with her friends. There she is. There's the smoke. Wait, wait. Okay, now she has seen the smoke. We start the clock. Can you see the clock on the top right hand corner? She has, we know that she has seen the smoke. <laughs> A bit stressed. Five minutes into it, eh? She's uncomfortable. Ten minutes. Oof, twenty minutes. Okay, after twenty minutes, the guy running the experiment comes and calls her out. Twenty minutes. She did absolutely nothing. Why? What do you think she was thinking? Because she's seen it before. No, it's a different woman. It's not the first woman that's seen it before. It's a different woman. <laughs> what do you think she's thinking? You could see that she's seen the smoke. It's not like I didn't see the smoke. She's looking around. What do you think she's going, is going through your mind? Nobody yeah, nobody else is moving. Nobody else is doing anything. So she's probably saying, maybe they know something. Maybe they know something that I don't. Maybe it's the norm in this place. Or, <laughs> or maybe she's thinking, I know there's something wrong, but I don't want to be the one to break the bad news here. For whatever reason, she's done absolutely nothing. Even though, again, please note, if she was sitting in this room, comfortably listening to me, and I asked, would you have called help for help? She would have said, of course I would. It's rational, isn't it? I'm not stupid, I would have called for help and go out of the room. And yet, you put her in a situation where, what's the situation? She's there with five other people, basically. That's what I changed. How many other people are participating in this one? Last example I'm going to give you. 
Will you be willing to stick your neck out and tell people they are wrong if you know for sure that they are wrong? Would you? Well, I would. That's what got me in trouble. This is the experiment. The question is, is line A equal in length to line 1, line 2, or line 3? Can you see it? Line A is equal to? Come on. Line 2. Come on, guys. You don't have a line here. Line A is equal to line 2. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's obvious. Now, here's the experiment. You take five people. Put them in a team. Four of them, you talk to them before they go into the team. And you say, look, when you go back in the team, I'm going to ask you this question. Now, I know it's obvious. I know that line A is equal to line 2. But when I ask you one by one in the team, you should say that line A is equal to line 1, OK? We're going to play this trick on the fifth person who has no idea we're going to play this thing on him, right? You go back in the team. You are person number five. You have no idea this is about to happen. You just sit there, and you look up, and what do you see? You see this experiment, and you say, oh, in your mind, this you're thinking, oh, line A is equal to line two. And then I ask the first person in the room, and he says, well, line one. <laughs> what goes through your mind? You sit over there, and I ask the first person, and he says, line A is equal to line one. What goes through your mind? Just Sorry? Just back. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he say? When he hears the first person say line A equals to line 1. He's wrong. He, there's something wrong with his glasses, this guy. Then I ask the second person. He too says line A is equal to line 1. What's he thinking? Maybe. Two idiots in the same team. <laughs> That's what he's thinking. Then I ask the third person and she says line A is equal to line 1. What's he thinking? It's, maybe it's something wrong with my glasses, eh? <laughs> Then I ask the fourth person, and she says, line A is equal to line 1. <gasps> and then it's your turn. <laughs> in front of everybody to give your answer. What would you say? Would you say, would you stand and say, all oh, four of you, you are all wrong, stupid people. The right answer is line 2. Or would you conform to the incorrect majority view? What do you think people do? Well, not all. But one third of the trial, the subject conform to the incorrect majority view. Look at the variation there. When the size of the group was only two people, you and somebody else, you never conform, you never change your mind. It's like, you're wrong, go and change your glasses. When I put three people in the team, you against two, conformity is 13%. When I put four people in the team, conformity jumps to 33%. The more people you put arguing against you, the more likely you are to conform. And here's a killer. The addition of one more descender reduces conformity to one fourth of what it was before. You know what that means? You say you agree with them, but deep down you don't believe it. You know they are wrong. You only need just another person in the team to take you aside, and then you gather the energy, the courage to say, yeah, they are all wrong. We are the right ones, and so on. Now think about it. This is an amazing result. Why? Because the question asked, the answer to it, is so obvious. There is no, maybe, maybe it's not line two, maybe I'm wrong, and so on. This, this is not an ambiguous answer. This is like, I know for sure this is the right answer. And despite that, one third of the people prefer not to stick their neck out and say what really is the answer, just to appear like they are team members and they agree with everybody else in the team. Yeah? There's two possibilities for this as to why people do that. Why do we conform? One possibility is that you sit there and say, you know, maybe they are right. Maybe all these people, maybe they know something and I don't. That's one possibility. The other possibility is you sit there and say, oh, they are all wrong. Of course, I know they are wrong, but I'm not going to stick my neck out and create waves here. I'm going to play along and agree with them, even though I disagree. Now, there have been experiments that try to differentiate between these two explanations. One experiment is, you put the five people in the room, and a sixth person comes in late. And because he's late, you ask him, instead of shouting his answers in front of everybody else, to write them down. And guess what? When you write your answers down, rather than verbally tell them in front of everybody else, conformity is down to 10% of what it was before. In other words, when people don't have to say in front of everybody else what their answer is, they don't, have, they don't conform. They say they are wrong, so I'm going to write down the correct answer. 
The reason we conform, in other words, is not because we think the other person is right and maybe I should listen to him or there. The reason we conform is because we don't want to create waves. We don't want to stick our necks up. Would you like to see some conformity in real life? Not only in experiments. Here it is. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat You're not going to behave like that, are you? <laughs> of course not. You're so different from everybody else. The most famous experiment of them all. I'm not going to show you anything here, even though I do have the video. It's uh, a psychologist called Zimbardo. He divided his psychology class at Stanford into prisoners and police. Some of you are familiar with the experiment. And then in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford, there were three rooms. He converted them into cells and he wanted to try out this experiment for one week to see how the police will behave towards the prisoners. These are all students, by the way, yeah? playing police and playing uh, prisoners. Within one day, the one prisoner had a mental breakdown and they had to remove him. Within two days, three prisoners had a mental breakdown. Why? Because the police started behaving towards them in statistic manner. They would actually torture them in a psychological way. They couldn't touch them. They couldn't physically torture them. But you could torture them psychologically. Various ingenious ways that they found to torture the prisoners psychologically. Week, uh, day three, six people had mental breakdowns. And you can, on the video, you hear them shouting, get me out of here, get me out of here. I want out. Day five, he had to stop the experiment. He was supposed to run for two weeks. But he said, it wasn't fair to these people who were breaking them down, they were, you know, they were becoming zombies. I had to stop this experiment. Very famous experiment, this one. The reason I'm mentioning it to you is because this experiment took place in 1971, 72, I think. 30 years later, this guy became very famous. He became the president of the American Psychological Association. 30 years later, in 2003, you may remember the case. Some American soldiers were arrested for torturing Iraqi soldiers or Iraqi people in the, this prison, what's called Abu, Abu Ghraib. You remember that? This guy, a psychologist, decided to go to court and stand on the defense team of those soldiers to actually defend them for the torture they did. And I'm not going to show you the video, but I have him on video with the New York Times when I interviewed the guy. And they said, you, a famous psychologist, the president of the Psychological Association of America, and you are defending these people? How could you do that? You know what he said in the interview? 
He said, I'm not defending the behavior. Torture is terrible. This is barbaric behavior. I do not condone it and I think it's terrible what they did. But the question I have to ask is, are they to blame for it? What is the situation that we put them in to blame for it? And having studied the circumstances of this prison and the commands that came up from the generals and the culture developed within this army unit, he said, I don't blame the people. I blame the conditions that we created for them. You can take an angel and if you put them in the same condition, he or she will behave in exactly the same manner. You could, because he said, if you look at these American soldiers who engage in torture, they are the typical average American kids. 18, 20 year old, some of them are educated. They never did anything wrong before in their life other than kill a lot of people. And you put them in a situation like that and all of a sudden they become barbaric and they engage in torture. By blaming human beings, we are not solving the problem. Let's step back and find out what are these conditions that take angels and convert them into devils. The guy actually wrote um, a, a book about it um, called The Lucifer Effect. Do you know who Lucifer was? Lucifer was, is the devil, but what was he before he became the devil? He was God's favorite angel. And somehow he flipped and went to the dark side. Why? Well, obviously God did not create the right conditions for him to be a good angel and so on. <laughs> His argument in this book that is all of us have in our hearts the capacity to be either good or bad. Whether it will be good or bad depends on the conditions you put them in. The same with any behavior. Any behavior you see out of people is not their fault. It depends on the underlying context you put them in. So let's go back to where I started. I started out by saying that it's the underlying context, social context, determines 70% of our behaviors. Let me give you a more formal definition of what I just said. Yeah, engineers will tell you that this is the most fundamental principle in system engineering, by the way, which is that the underlying structure of a system determines the behaviors in that system. So if you don't like the behaviors in that system, change the underlying structure. Don't blame people. We are all prisoners of the structure of the system. To change behaviors, we need to change the underlying structure. So far I've been calling it social context, engineers call it underlying structure. I like the underlying structure better actually, at least I'm going to use that terminology from now on. Whenever you have a system, an economic system, a social system, a, a mechanical system, where you get behaviors that you don't like, the problem is not the individuals in that system, the problem is the underlying structure of that system. I'll define for you in a moment what I mean by underlying structure and where I think we should be focusing our efforts in improving the financial system in this country or globally. But first of all, let's think what the system is. And this is a definition I found from a textbook. I like it. I like to provide to you. What is a system? A system is an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way to achieve something. Forget the academic mambo jumbo. I'm giving you this definition because in this definition there are three key elements that make up the system that I'd like you to be aware of. What are the key elements? One is this one. A system is trying to achieve something. There's a purpose to it. There's an objective to it. So the objective of the system is a big element of the underlying structure of that system. Secondly, a system has different parts, elements. There they are. But more importantly, these elements are combined in an interconnected way. So the three elements of the system I'd like you to think about are the following. A system has an objective or a purpose. It has elements, a physical makeup, and it has interconnections, such as values, norms, culture, incentives, how the information flows in that system, and so on. These are the three key elements of the underlying structure of a system. If you want to improve a system, think about these three elements. What can I do with these three components of the system? I'll give you an example with financial services in a moment, but first let me give you a, a more down-to-earth example of how you can change a system by influencing a little bit this underlying structure. Do you know this man? This one. Anybody, ever, anybody seen this guy? His name is Hans, he was, Hans Monderman. The guy died three years ago. He's a Dutchman. 
This guy is an engineer, was an engineer. He's credited with revolutionizing traffic design around the world. So much so that you'll see lots of his ideas actually being applied in London today. What was his idea? Well, he said, imagine you, you, you are a mayor of a city, you go in, you, you have certain streets where a lot of accidents happen. Let's say you have a, a road in your town, lots of accidents happen in the road. What do people do whenever there's a dangerous road like that? What would you do? Illuminate the road. What else? Avoid it. Avoid it. What if you cannot avoid it? <laughs> and the problem is not you as a consumer, you as a mayor. People would use, what do you do as a mayor of that city? What would you do to make sure that they don't have access? Well, what do we do? We put traffic signs, we put traffic lights, we put police, we put lanes, we put lots of things to guide people's behaviors in driving. This guy came up with the following idea. He said, suppose I remove all the signs. Suppose I remove the traffic lights, I remove the police, I remove everything. What will happen then? Will it, uh, would I get chaos? Or would I get improved behaviors? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's try it, he said. So he went to this place in the Netherlands called Drachten. And he said, I'm going to build roads that seem dangerous but are actually safer. And the most famous example is this one. It's an intersection in this town where on average they used to get 60 accidents every year. Some of them lethal, fatal. And I mean, you can't see it here, but there are traffic signs here, there are, there are pedestrian crossings, there are three lanes here. You cannot see, there's a lane for cars, a lane for cyclists, and a lane for pedestrians. Clearly separating the three modes of transportation so they don't mix and have accidents and so on. Police everywhere and so on, 60 accidents every year. More police, more accidents. So the guy said, it's amazing. He said, how about if I redesign the road like this? This is what he did. He removed all the signs. He removed all the lanes. You cannot see it here. This is what the engineers call share space here. The pavement is the same uh, level as the road. What you cannot see is that the pavement is colored differently. Usually it's in reddish color and so on. But it's like the road, just reddish. Same level and so on. No signs, no traffic signs, no nothing, just a roundabout, lots of flowers. You can't see the flowers now because the photograph was taken in the winter. And here, these are fountains. It's art. Water is jumping up and basically if there's a traffic jump, the water jumps higher. If there's no traffic jump, the water is low and so on. Two years in a row, zero accidents. Zero accidents. Why? Ask yourself. You're driving down this road. You come to this intersection, there are no traffic signs, there are no lanes or nothing. What do you do? Well, unless you are from Cyprus, you slow down, of course. <laughs> My country, you don't do these things, you know, just, we just go. Pedestrians beware, we say, and so on. Yeah, most of us slow down, and how do you navigate traffic? How do you navigate traffic then? As to who goes first and who goes second? You look, you look at people in the eyes. And it's like, okay, you go, and then it's my turn, and people who waited for two minutes, you say, okay, you go, and so on and so forth. You behave like human beings. Yes? This is the thing, you know. You take personal responsibility for your driving. The more signs we put in place, the more regulation we put in place, the more you take away personal responsibility from people. It's like, well, the regulation allows me to do it, I'm going to do it. It's within the rules. Even if it kills a few people, it's within the rules. Whereas if you remove those rules, people say, that, wait a minute. This is not the right thing to do, or do so and so forth. What did he do, this guy, to change the system? What did he change? He changed the underlying structure a little bit, the physical layout and so on. Let's go into a little bit the financial system. Would you agree with me that in the last two or three years we observed lots of suboptimal behaviors? <laughs> yes? You agree with that? Okay. <coughs> Will more regulation improve things? Well, I'll put the answer there in case you were wondering. <laughs> yes. On average, yes, it will improve things. Just like more regulation will get people to stop and help dying people on the street. Will people do it again? Yes. I'll tell you exactly when, in 15 years. You know how I know that? 
Because if you go and look at historical in the last century, we've had a financial crisis every 15 years, give or take. Okay, 12 to 15 years. You go and look, every 15 years we've had a crisis in the world. 1898, 1912, 1928, 1943, and it goes on like that. Every 10, 15 years we've had a financial crisis, and what happens every time we have a crisis? The government intervenes and puts more regulation in place, like, no, no, you cannot do that anymore, and so on. And at first, people are constrained by it, but then what happens? Some clever people, usually graduates of LSE, find ways to circumvent these regulations. And boops, we have another crisis, oh my god, let's put more regulation in place. Another regulation comes in place, and for about 15 years, everything runs smoothly until some other clever people find another way to go around the regulation, and whoop, we have another crisis. Every 15 years, which goes to show regulation could improve your short-term health, but it doesn't tackle the underlying problems here. It's my doctor telling me to lie down for 10 minutes and I will feel better. Yes, I feel better, but still have a heart attack two weeks later because he or she did not look into the underlying source of my dizziness, which is the blocked arteries. So what are the blocked arteries in the financial system around the world? Well, if you buy my definition of uh, the structure of the system, there are three things that you should be looking at to correct. The first is the objective of the system. What is the purpose of the system? And if you think about it, the worst innovation that happened in the last 20 years, in my opinion, was this idea that the objective of business is to maximize share for the profit. Which idiot came up with this one should be executed? <laughs> in fact, I know the idiot is a professor at Harvard, but that's not the story. <laughs> no, seriously now, I mean, uh, you're, you're too young to remember, but uh, I did my MBA in the early 1980s. And when I did my MBA, we didn't talk about this shit. Excuse the language. <laughs> we did not talk about maximizing share for the value. But in the late 80s, I remember it very well, it was a group of finance professors who showed up at Harvard Business School where I was, I was, and all of a sudden, their writings and their speeches in front of the US Congress was all about the role of business is to maximize share for the value and everything else is secondary, blah, blah, blah. And before we know it, it became the Bible. We reached a stage by the late 1990s where not, we took it for granted so much so that if anybody would stand up in front of anybody else and say, actually, I disagree, and so on, they would throw things at you. I know that for a fact because it happened to me at London Business School back in 2000 when I had to debate in front of a group of uh, senior executives with a professor from finance who came in and said, of course it's to maximize share for the value, and I tried to argue against that, and the executives themselves, they thought that I was Lucifer. <laughs> the purpose of business is not to maximize share for the value. The purpose of a company of business is to create goods and services that society needs and values. Yeah? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Trust me. And you're not a charity, by the way, okay? The reason you do that is that as a byproduct of that, you will maximize share of the value. But the goal is not maximizing share of the value. Because if you put your frame, your mind like that, you will engage into illegal activities. You will engage into unethical activities. Especially if I tie your, your remuneration to that goal. Whereas if I tie your enumeration to say, look, your goal is to create a product or a service that customers actually, they want it and they are willing to pay for it because it's good for them and it's good for their society. Guess what? You will be a successful business person. You will make lots of money because you're in the business of making money. You're not a charity and so on. I'm not saying don't make money. I'm just saying what is the focus? What is the objective here? And I'm sorry to tell you that we have distorted people's objectives by teaching them these things. It's wrong. This is not the purpose. So what do we need to do? I think one of the things we need to be thinking about in the system, the financial system, is going back and revising this, the objective of the system. What are we here for and so on? I'll talk a little bit as to who does that and so on. The elements in this way of physical, you remember the three definitions of the structure of the system? One is the purpose, the other is the actual elements and so on. And here, yeah, maybe there are some things that people are talking about. How many players do we have in the system? How big are they? Maybe we do have banks that are too big to fail. 
And maybe you need to step in and break them up and make them, you know, more responsible and things like that. So there's something that you could do with the actual makeup of the system, but all the evidence, actually, if you go and look at the research on this thing, is that this is the least influential element of changing the system. The most influential is changing the purpose of the system. This is the third least, uh, the most influential. The second most is focus on the interdependencies in the system. The interdependence. For example, who are the heroes in the system? Because that will tell you what are the underlying incentives in the system. Let me explain what I mean by that. Whose face do you see on the cover of Business Week or Fortune magazine every week? Do you see CEOs who care about the environment and corporate social responsibility? Or do you see CEOs like Jack Welch, whose call to fame is that he fired more than 120,000 people in his tenure? What kind of people do we honor as our heroes in business? Well, it's people who maximize share for the value, of course, and so on and so forth. Well, is there something wrong there? In other words, the underlying incentives in the system are such that encourage the behaviors you don't want. Well, don't blame the people then. You'll do the same thing if I give you the same incentives. What are the values in the system? The values. I was at this conference at Harvard where they were talking about the financial crisis and this elderly professor, I remember him from the 80s, Paul Lawrence, his name was, you know, it struck me because he's now 80 years old and he was just sitting there and shaking and everybody was talking about regulation and about this and that and he said, look, can I say something? And they said, yeah, Professor Lawrence, say something. And he said, well, it strikes me that the problem is that there are some really immoral people out there. If only you could teach them a few moral values. What is the right thing to do? Rather than go out and cheat, rather than go out and be individualistic, we teach them the right things and so on. Well, he's got a point there in the sense that the morals, the values of our society have changed and you have to think about it and so on and so forth. Whether education would be the way, I do not know. What are the values, what are the incentives in the system, what is the culture of the system? These are the things we have to be looking at, not regulate and so on. And my point will be that unless we change the purpose of the system, the values, the incentives, the underlying structure of the system, we're not going to manage to get rid of financial crisis and so on. One of the questions, of course, is, okay, who does all that? Is it the government, is it the schools, is it the families, is it the individuals? I don't have time to answer that question. But, <laughs> but I have another uh, optimistic message to leave you with. Whenever I talk about the underlying structure of the system, because say, my God, because you know, you're never going to change that and so on. Well, guess what? The evidence shows that small changes in the underlying structure can have big impact on how people behave. This is known as the butterfly effect. I don't know if you know this story about this uh, meteorologist at the MIT in 1962. He was running a simulation model to predict the weather. And one day, he wanted to input data into the simulation manually. So he took the data from the printout, and it, the number was 3.6 decimal points. So he input it to three decimal points. What difference does it make if I put in 3.333 instead of 3.33365, so whatever? So small, it's not going to change anything. He put the numbers to three decimal points instead of the six decimal points that he used to do it. And the results that came out of the simulation were just totally different from what he was getting before. And that led him to write a paper, famous paper which he presented at a conference in Texas called Would the Flaps of a Butterfly, the uh, Butterfly's Wings, when a, when a butterfly flaps its wing in uh, Malaysia, would that create an earthquake in Texas? And that became known as the butterfly effect. This is the butterfly effect. Small change in the underlying structure can have a fundamental effect on how people behave. Can I give you guys just a couple of examples of this one? Some cynical, some funny, and some serious. How many of you have been to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam? How many of you have been to the men's room in Schiphol Airport? This, this is a question for the men, obviously, in the room. Anything, anything interesting in the men's rooms? The fly. You notice the fly. What fly is that? Tell the ladies in the room because they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, let me explain what happens. Because the, <laughs> the, the women in the room are saying, what? 
What they did is, in every urinal in the men's rooms, they, they painted a little fly in a very strategic position in the urinal. Why? Because this may come as a surprise to the ladies in the room, but men actually like to aim when they urinate. <laughs> and uh, strange human beings, yeah. So they put the fly so that men can actually aim and so on. The position of the fly is very strategic, actually. They've done a study which showed that two years later, urine spillage in the men's toilets at Chipotle had gone down by more than 80%. <laughs> 80%, which makes you wonder what men used to do before, can I? Play in the walls and so on. All you did, all you did was to paint a little fly in the urinal. Let me give you another small serious example. If you actually go and look at um, the statistics on organ donations, you find fundamental differences between countries. For example, what percent of people in the UK donate their organs after death? Do you know? Very small. How much is it? I think it's around 12%. 12%. In, in, uh, in Sweden, it's 4%. In the United States, it's 28%. In Austria, 99.8% of people donate their organs. In France, you won't believe this. In France, the number is 100%. You believe it? So the question then is, what explains these differences? Why is it that in some countries it's 4% and in other countries, because it's a very important question, I hope you agree with me, donation of organs. Thousands of people die every year because they don't have an organ for transplants and so on. So it would be ideal if we could get 100% of the UK population donating their organs. You know what explains this? They try to explain it by religion, by its economy, by demographics, you know, per capita income, nothing, nothing, nothing. You know the big difference? It's the, it's the form you fill out when you file a form to get your license, your driver's license. In some countries, the question they ask you on that form is, uh, you will be an organ donor unless you tick this box. In some other countries, they say, you will not be an organ donor unless you tick this box. Well, guess what? In all countries, people do not tick the box. But in some countries, that immediately means you are an organ donor. And in some countries, it means you're not an organ donor, simply because people are too lazy to tick the bloody box. <laughs> it's not lazy, and it's actually, psychology will tell you it's the uncertainty, I don't know, should I, should I know? Then in the, not knowing, we don't make a decision, we don't tick the box. He's not making the decision. Think about it. The guy who designed that form in Austria and France, he or she is a genius. <laughs> Just changing the wording of one question. Just the words, increase organ donation participation from 4% to 100%. Can you imagine? Blood donation. What we know is that when you ask people, would you please give blood, please give blood, look at these people, they need blood. <laughs> On average in the UK, we found out that 42% of the people say, yes, I'll donate blood, I'll donate blood. And then you give them one week to follow up, how many of them follow up? Zero percent. Zero percent follows up. Even though about half of the people say, yeah, I'll donate blood. Yeah, of course, it's very important. What increases the zero percent to more than 50 percent participation is when you have one role model that they know who actually goes and gives blood. And then goes back and says, I gave blood. Oh, did you really? Okay, I'm going to go now. That jumps the participation to, from zero to 50 percent. Small changes like that can have an unbelievable impact. Last example I'm going to give you. I have lots of examples like this, trust me. Last example that I can give you is about your weight. This guy, a school teacher in Minnesota, he was concerned about children obesity. He said, I have to reduce the obesity of children. What can I do? I don't have any money. What can I do? This is what he did. He said, suppose I rearrange, rearrange the way the food is presented to the students in the cafeteria. Suppose that you know, I put first the vegetables and the salads, then the healthy stuff, then the meaty stuff and so on, then the dessert. Would that change anything? Guess what? Two years later, obesity levels down by 35%. Why? Because students will go there, kids will go there, put food in their table, in their tray and so on for plates. First they put the healthy stuff, the plate is full. They say, okay, I'm gonna go and eat and then come back and pack some more. Many people do not come back for more. They don't. And as a result, they don't eat as much. 
An amazing statistic I was reading the other day. Eating alone versus eating with somebody else. Would you expect to eat more or less or the same amount if you eat with somebody else rather than if you eat alone? Why? You are same hungry as before. Why do you expect to eat more? Last longer, yeah? Talking, you don't realize you eat a lot, yeah? How much more would you expect to eat if you eat with somebody else? Well, come on, 89%. <laughs> Are you Googling it right now when it comes out? It, no. It's actually up to how much? I would actually think, like, would observe the other person, how much the other person would see, and I would adjust my eating. You just yeah. Well, it's true, actually. It depends who you are eating with. We know that when women eat with other men, women eat much more. When women eat with other women, they don't eat. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I'm not making this up. But listen to this statistic. When you eat with one more other person, consumption goes up by 52%. Two other people, 50%. Seven other people, 98%. Can you imagine? When you are eating with seven other people, you double the consumption intake. That explains why all my fellow Cypriots are fat. <laughs> <coughs> Just one last example and then I'll finish. How do you get people to use the stairs rather than the escalator? This is what they tried in Sweden. So I started out an hour and 10 minutes ago asking the question, how can we avoid financial crisis in the future? And Howard said, if I have the answer, I would be a very rich man. Well, I don't have the answer, but my answer would be, how do you avoid or prevent this crisis happening again? Look at the underlying structure of the system and change the structure of the system. By structure, I mean the purpose or objective of the system, the various elements and the interdependencies of that system. This is what you should be looking at. This is where you should be focusing your attention. This is where you should be intervening. Would regulation be part of that answer? Yeah, yes, I have nothing against regulation. And I mean, I'm sure there are clever people, thoughtful people thinking about regulation and how it can influence behaviors and so on. But what worries me is that we always, whenever we have a crisis like this, we put all of our attention on the regulation answer and forget that there's these other things we should be aiming to change and affect. So hopefully that's a good enough answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my question is how do you make trading collateralized debt obligations fun? <laughs> um, this could perhaps be the answer. Uh, yeah. We've got a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, not long, I guess, but um, has anyone got anything they want to uh, throw out? Yeah. Uh, go with the pen there. Thanks. Actually, I've got, I've got just one quick observation, which is obviously you said the history of finance is littered with crises. Um, presumably not all of those can be attributed to shareholder value, which is a more recent religion. So even changing the, the goal of the structure may, may itself not be 
could uh, the, 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 the result. But my more general point is, uh, I mean, are financial crises such bad things? Are they something we just have to have to live with? Clearly, despite all these, this, this decadal crisis, we're much better off than we were in 1910, massively better off, orders of magnitude better off than we were in 1910, or obviously 1810. And are, are they such bad things? I mean, surely we're better off having progress with crises than stagnation with an artificial stability. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Of course, the patients, when the medicine is being taken, these are the people who suffer for the future generations to be better off. It's the, the forest, the, the, the fire in the forest that burns all the dead wood for regeneration to happen, argument. The, the, the trees that get burned, they don't appreciate that regeneration will happen, you know, 30 to 40 years ago, later. But you, it's a very good point. You know, maybe this crisis, we need them in the system just to help with the uh, growth and regeneration later on. Down here at front. Yeah, thank, thank you for your exciting talk and your, your wonderful ideas. Um, could you actually answer that question that you didn't, that you kind of brushed off? three slides ago, if you could go back. The one oh, about... Dear. Which question is this? It's the one regarding... Families, individuals. Oh, we all... This school. one here. Oh, at, least one. at least, you know, yeah. give us... Whose responsibility yes, is it? This is a really, really interesting question, so... I think every single one of these things that I put here has a role to play, okay? Again, I think schools have a, lot, a, a big role to play. Big, big role to play. Just, can, can I just give you another statistic that blew my mind away just two days ago? They've done this study a long time ago, to find out how many children have what we call divergent thinking. Divergent thinking is an ingredient into creativity. In other words, how many kids are creative? And if you score up to a certain, above a certain point, you are classified as genius in creativity. So they did this study on children between the ages of three and five. How many of them were classified as geniuses? Have a guess. 98%. We classify that now. Here's the interesting part: the same children now, the same children five years later, after they've gone to primary school, they've been educated in our excellent schools. They were given a very similar test. How? What percent of them? What percent of them were uh, rated as geniuses? Fifty percent. Now, here's the interesting part: the same kids five years later, when they were 13 to 15 years old, they've gone to high school now. They were given the same test, not the same, similar test. What percent of them were classified? 32%. The same test was given to 100,000 adults above the age of 25. What percent of them were rated as geniuses? 2%. What does that tell you? There's something about the school system that screws up the mind, basically. <laughs> yeah? I shouldn't be saying that I'm, I am an educator after all. So, but in terms of creativity, it makes us good in certain things, obviously. It makes us really good in conforming, like sit down, yes, sir, and so on. But so schools and education has a big role to play. I think the family unit has a big role to play, obviously. You know, we all say we become very individualistic and very spoiled. Well, who is to blame for that? Don't, don't blame me. You come to me when you're 30, when you're 25. Blame your mom and dad. You know, they spend most of their formative years and, and so on. Us as individuals, every, everybody on this list has a role to play. My worry, again, is that we put a lot of emphasis on the government. Oh, the government has to step in and the government has to do this. And yeah, the government has to do certain things. The government has. But how about the, everybody else? I think all these participants have something to play. Uh, Man with the yellow. Yeah. No, just to, to give one example, the G20, that when the crisis was at the height, uh, the, the G20 actually you know, got its act together and acted... Um, Fairly in a fairly united fashion, stimulus, etc. Now look what's happened. I mean, everybody's fragmenting. Everybody's acting their interests. You look at the papers today. What is it in the FT that Osborne actually? Well, I don't think I'll follow David Walker's advice and regulation because nobody else is. So you know, isn't it a question of who's going to go first? And the fact is, human nature. Nobody's going to actually. Is everybody's going to follow their own self-interest or their own mm. national self-interest? Yeah. Again, I mean, it does not go back to some of the things that I talked about, about our culture that needs changing, about... Yeah, a big idea, idealistic, fair enough, but, you know, you're saying that we're self-interested uh, and we're all going to go for our national or individual self-interest and there's nothing we could do about it unless there's a crisis? Well, maybe we'll go back to the gentleman there and say we need the crisis then to... 
Somebody, uh, there, there you go. Hi. Um, I work for a bank and I'm a Manchester City fan, so I think I've been attacked in an offerance tonight. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a question, it's more a general point. At my bank, the, um, our mission statement is now we want to be a great place for customers to bank and for colleagues to work. So I think what you're suggesting is already, I think the change is happening. We do, I mean, certainly in my bank, we don't talk about maximizing shareholder value anymore. So the question is, have your internal measures changed to reward you according to what you believe? Yeah. It, it, it's ongoing at the moment. We're looking at the... Re <laughs> <laughs> we, we're getting there, we're getting there. But I agree that we have to move away more from a, more from a you know, performance indicators that are set on, say, financial targets for people to meet. It has to be more around it being the right thing to do. It's, it's about changing the culture. But it, it, is, it is happening. We're not there yet, but it is happening. I'll remember it's ongoing at the moment as a new way of saying no. Um, <laughs> the, uh, good one. Sorry, there was somebody there in a uh, stripy shirt, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in the um, application of this to the environment. I suspect that the economic structure we have, economic growth is the only thing we must search for, is actually just the opposite of what we actually need. Um, have you got any comments on that? And not about accountants because the accountants didn't necessarily do a great job in telling us the um, credit worthiness of the companies. And the same thing is definitely going to happen when it comes to um, the uh, carbon emissions. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, I hate to throw statistics at you and numbers, but I, I, I only remember these numbers because they blow my mind off as well, uh, so much so. But I was reading the statistics, which basically, do you, know, do you know the population of the Earth today? How much is it? Let's say about 7 billion, yeah? Do you know how many people actually lived on this earth from the beginning of time until today, cumulatively? It's about 90 billion. I don't know how they calculated that, but it's about 90 billion. Now, the question is the following. How, given the resources we have on earth today, water and land and food and so on, how many, what kind of population can you sustain? And under two scenarios, if the average person on earth consumes as much as the average person in Rwanda, how many people can you sustain on Earth? Have a guess. 15 billion. Second scenario, if the average person on Earth consumes as much as the average person in North America, how many can you sustain? 1.2 billion. 1.2. So you, you've got the developing world. They, I mean, they aspire to rise to the same levels of economic activity as we do, consumption and so on. Yeah? And what does that mean? The more they rise towards our level, the more we're going to deplete the resources of the earth, and the more we'll have to find ways of basically exterminating about six billion people from this earth just to, for the rest of us to live uh, sustainably and so on and so forth. So you're very right, I think, economic growth. It's, I mean, it goes back to 40 years ago when the team at MIT actually wrote the, the limits to, to growth and, you know, basically alerted us to the fact that one of the things we need to worry about is economic development will create all these social environmental problems and we have to think very, very hard as to how can we achieve both at the same time. So maybe the answer to the, the environment question is we have to learn to lower our economic standards. Do I need to have five televisions in my house? Which is the average number of televisions they have in North America and an average household. Yeah, because they even have it in the toilet now. <laughs> Along with the flies. Along with the flies and the urine. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, I think that um, if we don't stop soon, the number of um, people we could have on the Earth's surface um, who consumed as much as the people in this room would be infinite since uh, no one's had any dinner yet. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop now. Thank you very much, Thank Custis. You. That was very interesting. <laughs>